I'm Shepard Smith. This is Studio B. It's the bottom of the hour. Time for the top of the news. As we learn more about the suspected killer in Sunday's mass shooting, there's a lot of speculation as to motive. Investigators say it's too early to know. Sikhs are sometimes mistaken for Muslims because they wear turbans, and officials say they've been, target, they've been targets of hate crimes since the attacks of 9-11. As we've been reporting, officials are investigating this as a possible case of domestic terrorism. The FBI defines that as, quote, the unlawful use of force or violence against persons or property to intimidate or coerce a government, the civilian population, or any segment thereof in furtherance of political or social objectives. Ooh. Fox News senior judicial analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano is joining us uh, at the table now. Uh, I'm, I'm, know, I'm smiling I, at your oof because it is a complex definition. It is. And, and it is sometimes confused with hate crimes. What's the difference between a hate crime and an act of domestic terrorism? And does the label that we put on a crime really mean anything? Well, in the case of an act of terrorism, yes, if there's a confederate. This person did it on his own, and in this case, he's dead already, so it's not, obviously not going to be a trial uh, in any penalty phase. But if he conspired with someone to do it, even if that person did not pull the trigger, they could be found guilty of uh, contributing to an act of terrorism that resulted in death, and they could be executed. So that's where motive, the motive of the killer, comes into play. Was his motivation that of a madman because he got thrills in killing, or was his motivation to strike fear in the heart of the government or a, or a segment of the population by attacking and murdering the innocents that he did? Uh, but members of one religion, would that, would that qualify? We have not seen an appellate level case where it has qualified for that. And, and when you get into religion, you get into hate crimes, when a person is targeted because of their beliefs. If this is an act of terrorism, these people would have to have been targeted because the person who did the targeting in his warped mind thinks he could change the policy of the government by killing them. Mm. But if he's killing them because he hates them, even if his hatred is misguided, like he, he thinks there's something that they're not. They're Sikhs, but he thinks they're Muslims. That's a hate crime. That's not an act of terrorism. That would permit an enhancement of the penalty for the shooter, not for the Confederate. Not that it would be fine to kill Muslims. I mean, of course not. You know, any this continuing storyline in this nation of these crimes targeting people on whatever level because they're not exactly like you. Is something somebody has got to help drag us out of it someday. And it, right now, it just feels like they're not trying to help drag us out of it. They are almost pushing us you, you know, toward it divide and separate. It, I want to get to another message, though. And that's about this other mass shooting. The, the judge in the, the, the mass shooting, the other one, the suspect in the 2001 massacre in Tucson, this says 2001, but it means 2011, expected to plead guilty in court tomorrow. You've heard about this. Jared Lee Loeffner is accused of killing six people and injuring 13, including the former Congressman Gabrielle Giffords. After a series of delays because of the, his mental status, sources say he's reached a plea deal with prosecutors. Back to the judge. Uh, it sounds like they're just going to get him to plead guilty, and I, I suppose what he'll get in exchange for that, though I don't really know, is uh, life without the possibility. Well, that's, that's the most that he can get. You cannot enter into a guilty plea which results in your own execution because only a jury uh, can, can uh, decide whether or not a person is to be executed under current Supreme Court uh, case law. I suspect that the government knows that it has some difficulty proving a capital murder case just because he is so loony. Mm. I mean, for them to prove that he planned and plotted to execute this federal judge who was there, they'd have to show that he knew the federal judge was going to be there and that he targeted the federal judge. The, the best case they have is that a crazy person decided to get some thrill in his system by killing people who just happened to be on a street corner. And rather than go through all of that and prove his sanity in Arizona, he doesn't have to prove his insanity. They have to prove his sanity. I think they decided that the best for everybody was a guilty plea with life without the possibility of parole. Is that unique to Arizona and another group of states, or is that something that's pretty common? You have to prove sanity, not insanity. Okay, we're in, we're in federal court, mm -hmm. and Arizona is in the Ninth Circuit. In the Ninth Circuit and in the Third Circuit, when you say you're insane, the government has to prove you're insane. In the rest of the country, when you say you're insane, you have to prove you're insane. That's, so the government has insane. a... It is weird that the Supreme Court has not resolved the, the split between the circuits. But in Arizona, 
the government has the heavier uh, burden. That's not the case in most of the country. Very interesting, Judge. Welcome home. Thank you, Chef. Good to be here. All right. There are brand new details this morning about the suspected shooter in Wisconsin's Sikh Temple massacre over the weekend. 40-year-old Wade Michael Page was a U.S. Army veteran, but he was forced to surrender his title of sergeant and leave the service after appearing drunk on the job years ago. Yeah, he was among the seven people who were killed on Sunday morning in a case that is being classified as domestic quote, domestic terrorism. So what exactly classifies this case as terror? We have a judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Nap Napolitano here. Morning, this is Morning. very interesting. So let's say, let's just sort of use a hypothetical here in New York City. Let's say something happens, a shooting like this. Ray Kelly, the police commissioner, comes out and says, this is an act of terrorism. The, the legal definition of terrorism is two or more acts of violence intended to change the policy of the government. By scaring the population or by scaring the government? Is that what happened in this case? That does not appear to be what happened in this case. By this case, you're talking about the Wisconsin Page. Uh, case. Right. Page appears to be, appears, he's dead, he appears to have been uh, a disgruntled nut job who hated Muslims, didn't know go. the difference between Sikhs and Muslims, and thought by killing the Sikhs, he was somehow going to eliminate the Muslim uh, population. It's an absurd, tortured uh, way of thinking. But it is not an act of domestic terrorism. On the other hand, the Fort Hood shooter mm -hmm. who killed military in the place where they work while damning and condemning the behavior of the government, the employer of the people that he killed, the government refuses to call that an act of while, domestic while, while hailing uh, While hailing Allah. To yes. his his words, are, and that's I mean, been verified. If that is not a case of terrorism, then nothing is. A so case you're of saying terrorism. the government got it wrong in the Nadal Hassan case. That was terrorism. They called it workplace violence. So what's at play here? I, I think what's playing here is is politics. I think that there's a political ramification to calling something terrorism. We it, it scares people. We look at it more closely. But if you call something a, a, a workplace violence, as horrific as it is, it doesn't scare us as much as it does with the word terrorism. You see, the, the, the law allows the government to prosecute plotters. Let's say Steve pulls the trigger, right. uh, but Juliet and Brian also plotted with him. It, Steve's we're all convicted, one unit. the two of you can be convicted in an act of terrorism. You'd get the same punishment. If somebody died, this is obviously a hypothetical, you would all get the, the death penalty. Right. Because the law allows the government to prosecute the, pro the plotters in a case of terrorism, the same as the trigger. And the person. bottom line is, uh, there, was a group, uh, there was a group tracking this guy and other skinheads and Nazis, because we got to stay ahead of something like this. I mean, this group's doctrine essentially is to wipe out everybody who's not white. Well, if these, if these people plotted with him, actually planned this assault and helped him, then they can be prosecuted under the terrorism uh, laws, even though he's They'll be dead. questioned, won't they? Oh, I would the think... The people in I these would, photos? I would think the government would question them, because sure. the government w would want to know who else is involved in this, and when is this going to happen, or when do you think this is going to happen next? All right. Uh, Judge Andrew Napolitano, always a pleasure. Thank you I much. hope I made this a little clearer. No, you, you did. did. You really did. There's a test coming later, Brian. Yes, it will be. Uh, written, <laughs> not multiple choice. <laughs> Thanks, Pleasure, guys. Well, new discrimination concerns in Louisiana. A charter school there tried to implement a policy that forces girls to take pregnancy tests if teachers suspect they might be pregnant and then bans any pregnant teen from attending school. State education officials have now ordered the school to drop that policy. Judge Andrew Napolitano is the uh, Fox News senior judicial analyst. Uh, hi, Judge. Hello, Penny Ann. So the ACLU got involved in this, and they had several arguments about why this is illegal. Legal, but what say you? Well, this is clearly illegal because it violates the right to privacy, but the school has certain rights as well. Here, here's, the, here's the conflict. The Supreme Court has said that the right to have children is a fundamental liberty and the government can't interfere with it and the government can't punish you for it. The Supreme Court has also said whether you are pregnant or not is a matter for a determination between you and your doctor and you don't have to tell anyone that you're pregnant. So you have those rights which belong to the pupil. The school has the right to administer its educational mission without undue interference from something a student is doing. So in order for the school to punish the student for being pregnant, the school would have to demonstrate that mere pregnancy alone, the status of being pregnant, materially interferes with the school's ability to deliver its educational product. That would be a very difficult showing for the school to make, which is probably why the Louisiana Department of Education, when they found out about this, said plainly, 
Forget about it. Yeah. Now, you know, this is a charter school, uh, not part of the public school district, but they still get state funding. So uh, how much leeway do they have to set their own well, rules? Well, when, when they accept funding from the state or from the federal government, we know they get state. They probably get federal government because the state dollars probably originally came from the federal government. And when they are subject to the re regulatory authorities of the state, then they assume what we call the mantle of the state, meaning they can't do what the state can't do. So they have the same constitutional requirements imposed on them as an ordinary everyday public school does, which is to respect the right to privacy of the students. I can understand why this school would want to discourage young women, you're talking about kids that are 15, 16, and 17, right. from becoming pregnant. But their discouragement must take a, a format that mm -hmm. does not interfere with the, the privacy rights of the young girls. Well, and the ACLU also made the point that they are encouraging uh, children to choose abortion over life, which is a whole other issue that they bring up in their suit. But we want to show now the statement uh, from the school itself, uh, in which uh, it says, in part, the school reserves the right to require any female student to take a pregnancy test to confirm whether or not the suspect student is in fact pregnant. If the test indicates the student is pregnant, the student will not be permitted to attend classes on the campus of the Delhi Charter School. We that, should say that they also say they're going to homeschool them. That is fundamentally unconstitutional and discriminatory against a person on the basis of someone else's suspicion. A teacher suspects that you are pregnant. It's just a suspicion. Mm -hmm. You refuse to confirm or deny that suspicion and you're kicked out of school. There isn't a court in the land in Louisiana or anywhere else that will accept that kind of a, a decision by administrators. Yeah, and, and the fact that when the girl is pregnant, uh, they say, well, but we are accommodating her. We'll tell her she can just get the schooling at home. That does not help. Well, it, it makes the case a little bit easier for the school because it is willing to deliver uh, the same services to her uh, in, a, in another environment. But the inconvenience visited upon the student without showing that her pregnancy is interfering with the ability of the teachers to teach and the administrators to administer just uh, wouldn't wash. It's too much uh, punishment for the exercise of a fundamental liberty, which is the right to get pregnant. Right. All right, Judge Andrew Napolitano, very interesting case. Thank you so much. Pleasure, Patty. Welcome back from vacay, Judge. <laughs> Thank you, Billy. Really? Yes. You feel good? You feel fresh? Well, absolutely. You feel young? I do. Oh, and nice. that's quite a task for me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. Not at all. So the internal emails seem to imply that the Treasury Department was driving, was the driving force behind ending non-union Delphi pensions. But what about this from former Treasury official Matt Feldman? Under oath, he said otherwise. As a result of Delphi, the Delphi Corporation bankruptcy, for example, Delphi and the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation were forced to terminate Delphi's pension plans, which means that there are Delphi retirees who unfortunately will collect less than their full pension benefits. To Judge Andrew Napolitano now. Judge, what do you make of this apparent contradiction? Did that official perjure himself? It, it appears that what the official said under oath, the clip that you just yep. ran, is 180 degrees from the emails that Mr. Colonnese and our, our friends at the Daily Caller found and revealed to the public earlier today. So what? Uh, spell it out for me. This Who? is a shameful period uh, in American legal history. It is a period in which political appointees in the White House were the driving and managing force behind one of the largest bankruptcies in history, that of General Motors and its affiliates. And the decisions as to how to resolve the bankruptcy were created and crafted by political figures in the White House, one of whom we just saw, though he works for the uh, Treasury Department, and a federal bankruptcy judge merely rubber stamped what the political figures wanted. And one of the things they wanted was to reward the labor unions that had supported the president and to punish the non-union members who probably did not support the president and they got what they wanted. Ron Bloom, the car czar, I believe, yes, in the White House, is he involved in this, do we know? Well, or, that, because you're saying that the whole General Motors bankruptcy, the Delphi situation, all of this was heavily political, and that it was a political decision to reward the unions, making them whole, but take away the pensions from the management people. Well, we just saw from the uh, emails, uh, Stuart, an instruction from the Treasury Department to the Pension Guarantee Corporation, no, don't come to this meeting at which we're going to discuss these things, even though the law says they have to be there because they are the ultimate guarantor. Stated differently. If General Motors is unable to make a payment on a pension, mm -hmm. 
and the bankruptcy court doesn't relieve them of that obligation. This corporation, the Pension Guarantee Corporation in D.C., has to make that payment. So they exclude that corporation from the meeting. They agree not to make the uh, pension payments to the Delphi non-union uh, people. They get a federal bankruptcy judge to go along with it, which is the only way you can break an obligation to pay a pension is if a bankruptcy judge uh, does it. And the Pension Guarantee people are blamed for something they didn't do and knew nothing about. But it got the cost of the bailout down, didn't it? It. Yes, it did. Put, they put the management pensions onto somebody else's books. There's another way to look at it. It, it, uh, it, re, it, uh, it relieved more cash, made more cash available right. to pay their union buddies who did quite well in this bankruptcy. Just to be clear, we are talking about a very human story here. Yes, we with are. With people who were really financially and emotionally damaged. And we're talking about 20,000 people who were management salaried workers at Delphi, which was the huge auto parts supplier to General Motors. It's a human story, not just legal, it's human. The government of hope and change, the administration of hope and change, mm -hmm. cut them loose with nothing to support them in their golden years. You know, you verged on sarcasm there, Judge, didn't you? Yes, I did. Yeah, shame on you. <laughs> Judge Napolitano, everybody, thank you very much. Pleasure, indeed. Stuart. All right, uh, the country of France now facing a tax rate of... 75%, and we're already seeing the effects. Business people saying au revoir. Uh, president raising taxes on the rich sounds familiar, so should this be a warning to people on this side of the Atlantic? And while that 75% sounds outrageous, Fox News senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano, says the U.S. could be heading down that same road. Hi, Judge. Uh, hi, good there morning, guys. 75% well, on the wealthiest? There, there, there's, there's bad news and there's good news. The bad news is that this tax rate is confiscatory and it's going to produce less revenue for the trench, French Treasury than is now the case because a lot of wealthy people will restructure their uh, income so they don't meet the ceiling, which is uh, 1.25 uh, euros, uh, 1.25 million euros to hit the 75% rate. The the good news is American voters will see what's happening right. when taxes go up. Revenue goes down and w rich people flee the country. Do we want that to happen here? And it's happened. The rich people are fleeing uh, the country of France. We've got a, uh, a graphic that shows that a model by the name of Letizia Casta, a restaurateur famous here in New York, Hélène Ducasse, and singer Johnny Holiday have all moved to countries just across the border to get rid of, uh, get away from the high taxes. But, Judge, all you have to do is look back to, you know, you hear 75% and you think, man, that's high. In the United States of America, in the past, the highest tax rates have been in the 80 and 90 percent bracket, I think uh, as recently as John F. Kennedy. Yes, and when John F. Kennedy and a Democratic Congress reduced the tax rate, the top right. tax rate, from 90 to 65, more money came into the Treasury. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but when taxes go down, people earn more money right. and pay more money to the Treasury. The French system is intended to punish the wealthy. That's the campaign of President Hollande. He promised the labor unions he would do with that. So by punishing the wealthy, he's going to punish the people whom the wealthy employ. They're going to lose their jobs. And once again, much as we're seeing in this country, President Hollande is, is vowing to do this to the wealthiest people, the 75% tax rate, yet it would only bring in a small amount relative to their budget woes. Symbolic. To the Treasury, because there's only a about, I read something like 3,000 people in all of France that Steve's, fit into this category. Steve's right. It's, it's symbolic. The president uh, of France ran on a campaign dividing classes. Sound familiar? Yeah. I, and he I, promised to punish that? the rich in order to help the poor. Sound familiar? So the American public will learn a lesson, hopefully before Election Day, when they see what's happening in France. All right. Uh, Judge Andrew Napolitano, au revoir. Thank you very much for the cautionary tale. <laughs> Pleasure, guys. Where's Kill Me? What's he doing? Taking he ran out. Too yeah. many French words in that teleprompter. <laughs> Thank you, sir.